You know what I got the other day, Pete? Stephen King's latest. Want to borrow it? Do you know who you're talking to? What do you mean? Andy, when's the last time I read a paper book? It's been decades. I would much rather use Kindle, or better yet, Audible. What am I thinking? I don't read paper books anymore either. I'm an audiobook guy all the way. For those looking to listen to the books behind the films that we talk about here on Movies We Like, not to mention all the other podcasts in the Next Real family, get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at thenextreel.com slash audible. There are so many great adaptations from Movies We Like available in audio form. Early on, we covered Casino Royale with director Matthew Gratzner. You went through all of the 007 books on Audible, right? I did indeed. What a series. We also covered Room with legendary D. Wallace and Never Let Me Go with costume designer Alana Morshead. We chatted about Fat City with cinematographer Sam Levy and Silver Linings Playbook with the great composer Harry Gregson Williams. 101 Dalmatians and Bambi. Apocalypse Now, There Will Be Blood, The Thin Red Line. There's so many great adaptations with so many great guests, and you can get all these as audiobooks on Audible, along with thousands of other great reads. Producing this podcast is a lot of fun, but it does take a lot of time. We have already dropped the dynamically inserted ads because they are so annoying and have no connection to our content. Plus, they just jam those things in wherever they see fit. We listened when you said you didn't like them. So now, we're directly appealing to you, our dear listener. Please, consider an Audible subscription to help support movies we like and the Next Reels family of podcasts. I've been using Audible along with my family for decades now. I love it, and I've read hundreds of books through it. Couldn't be more pleased with their service, and I know you'll love it too. Head to thenextreel.com slash audible and get your free trial. It really helps us out. And you have a world of over 200,000 audiobooks open to you. So much great material available. Dive in with a free trial and get your first free audiobook at thenextreel.com slash audible. Start listening to amazing audiobooks of your favorite movie source material with your first free audiobook today. That's thenextreel.com slash audible. Andy, I know you've never been happier than when you're sitting by a warm fire snuggled up in a flannel and basking in the glow of an old-school budget spreadsheet. (sighs) It is a special day I can shut down the world for a little me time. In a world full of applications, why do these antiquated documents and spreadsheets still run the world? And why haven't they been updated in over 50 years? That's why we want to talk about Coda. Coda is a new kind of doc that brings words, data, and teams together. It comes with a set of building blocks that anyone can combine to create a doc as powerful as an app. Coda runs our entire business here at True Story FM, from show scheduling across dozens of podcasts and scripts for thousands of episodes, to budgets and plans and wikis and more. Coda lets us see our business in a new light. If you'd like to shine a light on productivity in your business and save money along the way, check out Coda today at thenextreel.com slash Coda. Welcome to the Next Real Speakeasy from Rashpixel.fm. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. Speakeasy number three! Each month on the Next Real Speakeasy, we invite an industry guest to join us. And instead of serving up their favorite cocktails, they serve up movies that they love so that we can all talk about them. We'd like to welcome our guest to this month's show, actress, author, and inspirational speaker, Dee Wallace. Hailing from the wilds of Kansas, Dee started her acting career working in bit parts on various TV shows and movies, before joining Wes Craven in 1977's The Hills Have Eyes. From there, she not only found an amazing career making horror and sci-fi films like The Howling, Critters, The Frighteners, The House of the Devil, and the recent Halloween remake, but she's also kept incredibly busy in seemingly every other genre, having now worked in over 130 films and scores of television roles and series. Dee has worked with a wide array of directors, including Peter Jackson, Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, Blake Edwards, and Rob Zombie. And who could forget her acting turns with Lassie or Cujo? (laughs) In fact, fact, Stephen King says he's still pissed that she didn't receive an Oscar nomination for her performance in Cujo, and I would agree with him on that one. But for most people of my generation, she'll always be our surrogate mother because of her role in E.T. Actor, acting coach, healer, radio show host, and self-confidence builder in Children Everywhere, Ladies and gentlemen, D. Wallace. Wow, what an intro, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, it is such a treat to watch you listen to Andy introduce you 
uh, you <laughs> we are on we're we're watching each other we're not recording the uh, the the video stream but we are watching each other on Skype and you what are you what are you thinking as you hear all that history you know part of me goes wow I've really done that wow <laughs> you know and gosh I I guess I am all those things, you know, you don't think about it because you just do it. It's just your life, you know, Yeah. people keep telling me I don't value myself and everything I do enough. So I'm going to start tonight with y'all. Oh, well, we'll, <laughs> we will, we will value you for sure. Yeah. All right. So now, Dee, you brought a movie to the speakeasy that, that you, uh, you love and uh, you'd like to recommend to all of our listeners. And wow, I think it's uh, fair to say that this movie kind of broke me a little bit. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> broke but, you. Uh, you have to expound on that. Uh, oh, I will. Exactly. Oh, I will. But uh, yes, this is the movie Room, the new movie that uh, just came out last year, directed by Lenny Abramson. And uh, I guess my first question for you, Dee, would be uh, some people, you know, they say like favorite movies are the ones that they've had a chance to withstand the test of time. But this is a pretty fresh movie. So how did you end up picking this one as uh, one of your favorites to talk about? You said it broke you. I guess it's the same in America as being moved. <laughs> That's yes. It was, it was a pretty devastating <laughs> sort of experience for me. Why, why did it devastate you? You know, I think it was because um, I have a five-year-old son myself oh. uh, in addition to my daughter. And so just kind of watching this young child have to go through some of the things that he had to go through and just kind of re-experienced kind of this world that had just opened up to him, um, particularly once they kind of broke free from the room. Um, yeah, it was see, my, my favorite part of the movie is the first half. And I thought it was so such a beautiful commentary about how little we need to make a whole world. Mm. He didn't he didn't know any different. He 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 hadn't been introduced to anything more than his imagination in those four walls. I think it says something very interesting about the human consciousness. The more we're introduced to, the more we're affected by it. And really, the, the, one of the statements in the movie for me was he was happier in the room. He, once he got out of the room, he knew he had to expand and life had to expand. But life in the room was simple. And they knew what to expect, even though some of the moments weren't nice moments. They they had their life managed, and right there was a when, structure. Yeah, and when he when they left that room, you know, he wanted there was a part of him that wanted to go back to it, and I think you can say that about all of our childhoods, whether they were happy or whether they weren't particularly, we want to go back to those times that moved us when we were innocent and everything was before us and we really didn't need that much. I, I love the concept of, of what you're talking about and what room represents. There's this, there's a, a book that is, it, it doesn't involve sort of the kidnapping, but uh, it is by a, a woman named Jane Smiley. It's called Goodwill. It's a novella and it talks about a, a very similar thing. There's this parents and there's sort of authoritarian father who who goes to the, he's, he's a back to the lander, you know, and he buys this land, he builds a house by hand and he has a child and the child is fine he he is homeschooled he learns to milk the cows and slaughter the sheep and he does all the stuff of the farm and they only he he only runs into trouble once he is introduced to the culture at large right once he has to to find a way to integrate where you have these two cultural identities that suddenly come into conflict with one another and and that for me is what that halfway point that 50 minute point is at at room it's when you know, the the crushing scene for me is watching this kid forced into a level of independence to jump out of this truck and and meet the real world uh, in such a shocking way. And, and the way that was depicted was it was just I, I'm with Andy. I was broken, too. I it, as soon as the movie was over, I found myself it was it was 1215 at night. I couldn't stop the movie. And I went up into my children's room and I I put my hand on them because I, I had to touch them. I had to be. Near you guys them. are really wussy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the film got over and I went, 
Yeah, that was a good effective. Yeah, that affected me. <laughs> that was good. Oh yeah. No, it it <laughs> You know, I, and I watched it with my daughter who's now 27. Um but also my best friend and and um it's interesting. She's a, a very good actress in her own right. And we were sitting there kind of, well, being critics, you of know, course, and yeah. what we liked and what we didn't like. And, and she was like me. She liked the first of the movie. I mean, I love the whole movie, but I think the, the brilliance of the movie is before they leave the room. I hated William Macy's character. <laughs> yes. I, I'm yes. sorry. It was just flipping over the top and not that he played it as a caricature, but I think it was written as a caricature. It was te- it was terribly written. Why did he even have to be in there? I get that they were divorced, but he played it was such a, a dumb fly by night character yeah. that we could have done without it and gotten the point. It's like, let's nail it on the head. Some people are going to judge you for being the child of a rapist. Yep. Really? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that that no. did hit it on the hit the nail on the head a little too hard. Especially yeah. because the 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 surrogate dad, the the uh, Leo, that was his name, right, Leo? Yeah, Leo. Uh, he was so terrific at, yeah. at right. taking up the mantle, the paternal mantle. He was just terrific, and so I I totally agree. I am vindicated. And you know, it was interesting too. Um, the one thing that Gabrielle and I neither one bought was the fight between the mother and the daughter. Uh, It just wasn't real to me. Other than that, I think it's an absolutely phenomenal movie with some really great statements. And one of the beautiful um, moments for me was that innocence in the truck. When he's in the truck and, and looking up, at the trees and the sky and the vastness of this freedom. And it's so simply done, but it's so full and so beautiful. I just, I, that, that's the part that brought me to tears. Well, but, I think that's, I think that's what uh, Lenny uh, Abramson, the director and his DP, Danny Cohen uh, captured so well was like the perspective from from Jack. They they really focused on little details uh, both in the room like you kept seeing little shots of the sink or the wallpaper or just whatever it was things that were part of his world that you just focused on and you really got to know those details. I loved how they they yeah. really brought you to his perspective through all of that stuff. And likewise, like you said, once he is out past, you know, the skylight, the only view of the outside world he has and he actually sees the trees and sees the sky and sees everything and he just takes it all in i really loved how they kept bringing those details back and even when he's in the house you see the little details of him just like looking at something through the perspective of the 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 banisters on the on the railing and things like that i mean they really kept that perspective for us through the whole film well and and also the banisters and everything see it was another way to kind of hold him in he was safer when he was held in when it was smaller, he was safer when there wasn't so much freedom. And actually, um, Bree's character was uh, not happier, but less tormented when she was in the room. Uh, when she had to deal with her mother and her bigot father and, and you know, the neighbor's and, and how they were judging her and all the judgment out there and her own, oh my God, I have to decide what am I going to do with me now? I've, I've been able to blame the lack of who I am, for want of a better phrase, on the fact that I've been kept hostage here and captive here. But now I have to step out and take responsibility for myself. You know, it's a it's a beautiful juxtaposition of the pros and cons of staying small and growing bigger and freedom and captivity. Uh, I, I just thought it was a really interesting 
study about human nature uh, within those confines. I, I I think there are there are certain sort of categories of films that make you that really allow you to explore this alternate perspective. You know, when you look at sort of uh, maybe Orange Is the New Black or Oz or sort of the the prison shows. You know, and and there are the more sort of um, grotesque uh, takes on this. The the horror takes, the kidnapping, the buried alive stuff. You get the kidnapping stuff, but but it is it's this is the rare film I think for me that that gives you the opportunity, the sort of playground to really. Uh, internalize uh, what it what it means to be, and I think Brie captured it really well. What it means to be um, taken from the world and put into such a, a compressed space, and and let us kind of live through that experience. I think that that's what I love so much about the first part and the transition to the second part. That that for her, uh, life becomes that much more difficult on free. Yeah, I am. You know, you loved her. Yeah. You loved her so much for creating this fantasy that allowed him to be happy. You, yes. you loved her for, um, you know, creating a world out of a room and, and a, a world that was full for him where he was very happy. I mean, it was... Gosh, I, I would hope if I were ever in the position, I could be as creative as that character was. Well, and you know, on the other side of that, there's that there, there there's the moment when you start to hate her, when she sits down across from him and starts trying to tell him the truth. And, uh, you know, that, that was something I told you because you were too young, she says. You wouldn't have understood it, she says. And that's the part where your heart starts to break a little bit because you're thinking, oh, my God, she is about to just shatter this kid's reality that is, even though it is in the context of kidnapping, it is the, the child of a, a, a born of a of rape, it is still <laughs> miraculously precious uh, that they made the, they made it feel precious in this context, and and that's when I started to just hate a little bit. I was so mad. Oh, see, <laughs> and I had a whole different reaction to that because I thought, yes, this is the strength that a mother has to have. She's got to save her kid. This is the chance that she has. As frightening as it is for her, as as daunting as it is to send her kid out there. This is this is her where her character really shines through. This is the arc that as an actress I would love to play. Well, that was kind of a that was one of my questions for you just thinking about the the kind of you know, the archetypes of moms that you have played. <laughs> <laughs> right, because there's yeah, different... I about every kind of mom there is. You really have kind of played the spectrum of moms. Like, what are you thinking about as you're sitting there in a in the role of a of a critic who has de- who has devoted as much of your professional career to thinking about these kinds of topics when you look at Brie and Jacob's performances? Very mm-hmm. much like the relationship that you saw in Cujo. Yes. And mm-hmm. and the same sort of context, right? You're kind of yeah. trapped in this confined space for much of the film. Yeah. I thought she did an absolutely brilliant job. Uh, I, I really did. And I, I felt like I was looking through a keyhole uh, at a real mother and son. And I don't think you can ask any more of an actress than that. I think what, uh, what worked so well for me is that we're watching her in this create this fantasy world for for Jack so that he's got this world and he's got his routine and he's got everything going on but we also really see the parenting side of that coming through we see her frustrations dealing with him and and her struggling with patience when you know his little 5 year old uh perspective doesn't jive with how she's trying to guide things yeah. And I think there was so much strength in that. And watching her in the situation, I was like, geez, I, I should take some parenting lessons from her. I mean, she's <laughs> she's doing such a good job at managing her uh, her frustration and yes. anger with her child, if, right? If now. only we all had a script as a parent. Right, exactly. You know? <laughs> and a really good director. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, yes, oh. I, I agree. I agree with that. And one of the things... And there's actually a few movies out uh, up for the awards now. It's been so refreshing to see these smaller, 
more intimate, more relationship films surfacing as the winners. You know, The Danish Girl, beautiful, incredible film. That thing, and I can't even really tell you why it haunted me so much, haunted me for days after I watched it. Would you say it broke you? (laughs) (laughs) No, I didn't say it broke me. Things that, that are really hard for me to watch that I get angry about in the about the injustice and everything. Sexual stuff doesn't break me. Sexual stuff doesn't break me. Break. <laughs> um, you know, but um, the 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 stuff about injustice, a lot of the slave stuff is really hard uh, for me to watch. Uh, I'm still trying to gear up to watch Beast of No Nation because I I just don't know if I can. Yeah. See, that's my wussy side. <laughs> I'm just I'm one. just glad to know you have one. That <laughs> makes me feel better. <laughs> well, you know, after after uh, what 20, 30 years of of playing heroines in horror films, I don't get wussified real easy. You know, Pete, I'm I I'm always the blonde that makes it, and the <laughs> monsters don't. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a a great little film in Australia called Red Christmas. And, um, you know, I took it because it was another tour de force, female head of the family, saving everybody kind of picture. It's a really interesting picture, but I truthfully didn't know if I could still do it. And I did all my stunts, all my own stunts and everything. And, and, um, how you, you know, how'd you, how'd you do? Did you, did you walk yeah. away with any injuries? Did you walk away? Do you feel yeah. you feel feeling as strong now as you did before you started? I have a couple of marks for life on my leg. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Red badge of courage. Another badge. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But you know, I'm sure if you talk to to Bree, there's a part of her. Um, you you can get scarred from doing films in a variety of ways. Um, I'm still on on adrenal medicine um, from Cujo because it just blew out my adrenals. Totally. No kidding. Wow. See, your body doesn't understand that you're acting. You know, any uh, Olympic athlete will, that's why they work so much on imagination and taking themselves through imagining all the slopes and everything because your body does not... um, differentiate between imagination and and reality. And so when you're doing a film, much like Room, where you're in fight or flight all the time, um, your adrenals get whacked. And, uh, you know, that's why, you know, the, the famous story of Vivian Lee, who never came back from Streetcar. Right, right. Um, you know, you guys just think these are easy gigs. We give our lives for these parts. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, we and we have done Cujo on this very show, and there was nothing about that conversation that implied it was easy. That was terrifying. Who Even really? today, I I still watch that. I'm like, how how are they doing this? That dog seems so vicious. <laughs> you want to know how? And they were all there were 13 dogs, and they were all trained to go after different toys. Ah, so we had to tie their tails down so you couldn't see them wagging. Um, <laughs> and on action, uh, Louis Teague, our fabulous director, would, or, and Carl um, Miller, who, who trained all the dogs, he'd go, dig, dig for that toy, dig for that toy. And so, you know, and, and, and so they looked very ferocious from their butt up. <laughs> but at the same time, we weren't damaging the dogs too much because it was a game for them. Sure, sure. Totally so different. Everybody for was very focused on taking care of the dogs, not so focused on taking care of D. Exactly. <laughs> Best job they ever had. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. But I well, thought, you know, I think it's a real injustice that uh, Jacob didn't get nominated. That's what I was going to ask you about. I mean, having uh, worked with some incredible child actors yourself, I mean, this kid was just a Amazing. dominant force in this film. He was unbelievable. 
yeah. it really was a, just an a, a incredible performance. And I know he was a little older. I think he was eight when they made this, and he was playing a five-year-old. But I tell you, I mean, he was just spot on perfect through this whole thing, and I was right there with him. The fact that it was from his perspective and that he did such a good job, I mean, it really brought me in with him through the whole film. Oh, he was he was bloody amazing, that, that kid. You, you're so funny. You said, well, he was eight, so of course he was better than if he did. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's got those three extra, extra years to think about what it was like when he was So five. sophisticated. <laughs> three four years to get into his head. Listen, the best actors I work with are kids. Yeah. Because they're just there. They're just there in the moment, you know. Uh, unless their mothers get a, a handle on them too much, they're just there playing with you. But this kid was—he really, really should have been up. Of course, you can say that about so many of the performances this year. There's, there's so much yeah. amazing competition. Yeah, it's always hard when they limit it to five performances. It's like gosh, there's a lot more than five good performances this year. Well, and it's interesting too to see what kinds of pictures you know the the academy always you can do a great performance in a horror film you are never going to be up for an award no they way. just don't take them as serious pictures you know um really hard films like compton um is it's not really the kind of film that gets put up for an academy award it's the kind of film that doesn't have anything to do with anything else. And, and so if you look at the films that the critics love and you look at the films that get up for the awards, usually they're not the big blockbuster. They're the small, intimate, um, somewhat easy to watch, you know, a critic kind of movie. And that's, those are the people that usually get nominated. I'm quite surprised that Joy's up myself. I I don't get it, but I think there were a lot of other pictures should, that should have been up instead of that. Yeah, I um I'm with you on that. And nothing against Joy. I mean, it was but but it was it was a similar thing last year for me with Birdman. Like I or was that 2 uh, yeah. years ago now? I mean, it was like that was a movie that I watched and I walked out and I thought that'll be a movie I don't need to see again. And, yeah, and I, 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 I didn't get it. I, <laughs> I understood. I understood why everybody was so impressed with it. Yeah, because it was so different. And I understood why everybody was more impressed with the performances than they would have been with those performances in a regular movie. Did you get what I'm saying? The the movie itself was so special and so different and so unique that it kind of swept everything along with it. Not that every single performance in there wasn't good, but I think if it had been in a if those performances had been in a film like E.T., they would not have uh, moved people the way they were the way they did in a film like that because yeah. it was just so spectacle flipping. Weird, yeah, weird right. and it, different in a critic film, you know. Let me tell you, sometimes when we're looking for a film to go to, and I go, Well, what did the critics say? Because if the critics really loved it, usually I don't. <laughs> it's it's yeah. true, yeah, I buy that. They're they, they're, it's a very intellectual look at a film, and I think a film should be made to move you. There is a level of film out there that is very uh, intellectual, and I, I do have a much harder time getting into intellectual films than I do uh, films that uh, that wrap me up emotionally. Yeah, although you know, it was just so breathtaking to see, for me this year to see really solid performances like like Brie and Jacob and and um, the Danish girl and even Bridge of Spies. You know, beautiful nuanced performance there uh, i when i saw it i said he's going to be up for an award if he's not it's it's a sin um yeah he was he was great in that film. oh my gosh just and so subtle and so brilliant um yeah so it, it was it was lovely to have some of those 
real solid relationship kind of films where you're not relying on no story and a lot of special effects. Yeah, I was going to say, so, so we've been, you know, talking about all sorts of different things, but I, I want to talk to you about some monsters for a second there, uh, about this. Oh, I, I know nothing about monsters. <laughs> you know nothing about monsters. Uh, so there's, I, I see like there's three, there's three antagonistic characters really in this film. Well, that, that are kind of depicted that way. We've already talked about William, William H. Macy, uh, briefly and just kind of the, the, a little bit on the nose portrayal that he had of the of the guy who just views this child as a you know a monster, but then there's also uh, Wendy Crewson playing the uh, the media. She's the media side of things, the reporter who does the interview, and of course Sean Bridgers who plays the uh, plays old Nick. And I, I think it's just interesting. Um, I mean, my favorite, I, Wendy Crewson, I think was just really designed to just make you hate the media. I mean. It got the reaction from the crowd that I think that they were expecting people to get, you know. But Sean I Bridgers, it was a pretty true portrayal myself. I did too. I I did. I just felt that uh, like, oh, of course, this is going to how this is how it goes, you know. And I I see these interviews like when uh, was it Elizabeth Smart? Yeah. When she did like her interview after her whole experience, you know, I always ask myself, why are these people doing these interviews? I would not want to be around any of that. And then you see in this film, it's, you've got the legal side of things, you know, pushing you to do it because, hey, this is going to cost a lot of money. We need to find a way to pay for it somehow. This would help. And, you know, I feel so bad for these people who've gone through this, who get pushed into doing these sorts of things. And just like the trauma that it ended up creating for her, it was, it was yeah. awful. I think I think the media was used to portray what was going on in her subconscious anyway that was going to have to come out for her to deal with. Which part? What do you are you what do you speaking well, specifically? The, the part, gosh, I can't remember exactly what the line is, you know, but basically it was couldn't you have been a better mother if you had whatever that line was. Yeah, well, yeah. The, if you had given your if you had encouraged him to take your son and given him a big uh, given him away. Yes. And as a mother, I know that that would obviously be going on within me. Whether I'm conscious of it or not. So so the in instead of playing that out or saying it in exposition, we got to see it happen with the media. So there, that worked on two sides for me, both a commentary on what's going on within her character and what the media is, as we all know. I mean, the only time the Inquirer ever came to my house was when Chris died. Jeez. And I opened the door and, and this little girl standing there like a scared chicken and she said, Miss Wallace, I'm so sorry to bother you. I'm from the Inquirer. And I looked at her and I said, really, you are not doing this. You never came before and you're coming now that he's dead. <sighs> and she said, please, I'm so sorry. It's my job. I'm so sorry. And I said, I'll give you one quote. He was my best friend. <sighs> and that's all they got. You know, they put the rest of it. But it comes with the territory, guys. It comes with the business. Well, now, you, everybody wants to know everything about us. And unfortunately, they do. And then you have people, pardon me, like the Kardashians that come out and go, oh, well, let's make it really in vogue to show our butts and our tits and our sex lives and our drugs and everything. And we're going to show it openly, which gives everybody else. Uh, kind of the message that it, that's okay, and they should know all that stuff about us, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, and I, well, that's one of the things that I think was was done really well. And I, you know, I appreciate your your uh, perspective that this is that the the use of the media was to play out what was going on in her head. I did not, I did not see that, and I think that's just my perspective. You know, watching the film, I did not bring that uh, that to it because I come to it from a perspective of of journalism and and broadcasting. And to me, 
William H. Macy, Sean Bridgers, and Wendy Crewson together are the monster in this film. I mean, it is the outside world that became the monstrosity that she now has to face, yeah. and, you know, and, and um, that... Really, William Macy's character was as much, if not more, of a monster totally. as, as Nick. Because because he represents yet this uh, this additional thing that's going to bite you. It's going to just nib, nibble at your flesh until you are bones, and and that drives her to to do the the unthinkable thing. Because you you think she just had this incredible moment of triumph, and and she she accomplished this great thing. She had a plan. She she taught and encouraged her child to do this unbelievably difficult thing yeah. and escape. And that is something to be celebrated. Celebrated, and for her, meeting the monster on the other side of that skylight, on the other side of that door, led to her going down the road of suicide. And that was um, that was just a horrifying example of the monsters that exist in the world. And and how unfair is it that when she meets the world again, she's not faced with joy and reconciliation and warmth and welcoming. She's faced with legal fees. Well, and she's faced with, come on, mothers and fathers are supposed to be the most understanding, nurturing, you know, they're yeah. supposed to be your safe haven. Right. Right. And she comes home and, you know, as sort of patient as the mother was, she was cold. I thought she played her very cold. I would not have played her that way. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I and and. And so they, the people who are supposed to be the antithesis of your monsters, become the biggest monsters in your life. And I think the room itself went back and forth between being the monster and the saving grace. The nest. You know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, and that was a really touching part at the end when he wanted to go back to room and wanted to kind of have that sense again of that space and I, it was it was so interesting that by the time they actually do go back there it's almost like he now realizes that room is not what he thought it was and the way that he goes back and he's like wow is it is it always this small did they shrink it i can't remember exactly what he said but you know just that perspective that all of a sudden he had where it was, it was so tiny and nothing seemed the way that it was and so he had that he ended up creating all he had left really was the mental image of what room was for him well, I think it's brilliant too that it's room and not the room. So why? Right. Why do you say that? Well, because it's a person, yeah. like Pete, Andy, D, room. That was its name. It became a person for them. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, you know, you could say the same thing about womb. You know, I mean, for him, <laughs> he was he was born from his mother, but he wasn't born to the world until he was, you know, five or seven. You know, I mean, he was he was. Um, he 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 had this this extra long gestation period that that I think makes this kind of the ultimate coming of age story. Uh, weirdly, <laughs> I mean, you think I, you you think we're wussies talking about the first part of the movie? I mean, when he goes back and they say goodbye to all these things in the in the in the thing and walk out of the yard, I was I was just I, that's I was a mess. Well, it's nice to know there there are sensitive, open hearted men out there, guys. Where were you when I was looking for my wife? You you could have been. You were a great marketer for for sensitive new age guys like us. Absolutely, <laughs> I have been all my life too. <laughs> the, have you read the book? No. Neither have I. Andy, did you ever read the book? No, I haven't. I was curious about it. Um, uh, you know that uh, Emma Donahue. Is it Donahue? Is that how you say that? Donahue. Yeah. Donahue. Um, I'll take yeah. that for right now, yeah. Andy. Yeah, well, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Um, I thought it was interesting. I, I, you know, I looked a little bit at it, and I saw that um, she had kind of come up with this idea. She heard about uh, this child, five-year-old Felix, in the Fritzel case, which I wasn't aware of. But um, have you boy, heard about this, D? It's, I went, it's a dark, mind-numbingly dark, dark, dark story. Um, that you know, it's 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 uh, almost a, a level worse than this. It's a father who, when his daughter's 24, traps her into like a secret room he's built in the basement and then keeps her captive there. Uh, no, she wasn't 24. She was like 17, was 17, but he kept her there for 24 years <gasps> and, ha and had like five... Seven children. Seven children with her, five of, or two of whom died. 
and uh, three and, of them he raised with his wife, who didn't know that the daughter was in the basement, and they they raised these three children as foundlings, and the yeah. others were kept okay. in in prison in the you basement. You know, I have one thing to say about that wife: get a life. You know, <laughs> yeah. if you don't know there's somebody in your basement, then you're not really very present in the world. I know if there is a rat in my attic. <laughs> Come on. I don't buy that. I don't buy it. I don't buy it at all. It, yeah. I mean, I buy that she ignored it and shut it out and purposely decided not to know it, but I don't believe that on some level she didn't know it. I think that there's, yeah, there's something with the mom, the reason that she she kind of bought into everything Woo! that husband told her. Yeah, I, it, it's it's a disturbing sort of story that, uh, you know, I, it sounds like after the after the daughter and all of her children came out, she actually ended up kicking the mom out of their place because she she you know basically felt similar to how you feel that mom wasn't present enough and and was not aware oh, come she on. should have been aware of you know things. it's like oh honey you found another lost kid and we can keep her oh, <laughs> right, that's, I know. Like, that's like you know sharon saying i didn't know they were shooting me up there <laughs> you know i don't buy it yeah <laughs> if you're present stuff like that and you have any kind of mentality in you at all uh, even even uh, Things like this incense me. Truly, truly. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what I think makes this... Now, that would have broken me. That yeah. would have broken me. Yeah. Well, and that's what I think makes this, makes the, the story so fascinating. And I think... But, Andy, did you discover anything about the ch uh, changes from the book to the production? Uh, the only thing that I, 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 I could tell, just reading... I only read just kind of the, the brief little synopsis. It sounded like they talked a little bit more about what happens to old Nick after he gets caught. And I know you kind of get a tiny bit of that with the kind of in the news story here, but this one in the book, it sounded like there was more uh, giving a sense as to what, what actually happened to him. He's yeah, found... Yeah, moviegoers are not going to care about old Nick as long as he gets it. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was the thing. I, I sort of walked away thinking, gosh, if there's one element of this that I would have, that I personally would have been more satisfied with is is actually knowing that he got, the, you know, seeing the just desserts. I needed something a little bit more redemptive about that. That would have, I think, unfortunately, probably come by way of the media, which may have been too redemptive on behalf of the media, which they were, I think, using in a well, different way. You know, and I think, too, uh, a director and a filmmaker has to decide how to hold the focus on, on, on what he wants the focus of the film to be right. and the statement of the film to be. And the statement of the film was not about old Nick. It was about the relationship between the mother and the son and, um, and the, the subjects of freedom and um, containment. And, and where those played out everywhere in their lives. It's like, you know, in E.T., there was a whole secondary story where E.T. had a love affair with Mary. And ultimately, yeah. it dissipated the focus of what the film was about, which was about Elliot and E.T. And the, and e. That's fascinating. You were going to ask me ages ago about monsters. Did you ever ask me? Oh, you know, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. I was actually going to ask you, because we already talked about uh, two of them at least, uh, Sean Bridgers. I don't know what you guys thought, but I really enjoyed the way that they uh, wrote him as old Nick and the way that they really portrayed this creepy character who really seemed kind of fleshed out. I, I enjoyed that he... Human. Yeah, he seemed just like a guy, you know? It didn't seem like, oh, well, he's a creepy guy who's who is, uh, you know, of course he's the one who kidnapped somebody and kept him in his shed because he's a creep. He just seemed kind of like, oh, he's just, he's a guy. If if they were just in the house, it would have seemed like kind of a, a distant uh, a husband who's not quite there, you know? Yeah, if you, had put, if you had put them on a farm, he could have been, you know, uh, an old gruff farmer that just didn't care about taking care of his family. Yeah, you know, for me, the when I realized he was human uh, was the the when he came in and was using her as sort of his conscience when he was telling her, uh, you know, I lost my job. 
Like when they were having that moment, it felt the most like like a a couple, a very strange couple, but that they had actually a fleshed out relationship to the point where he he could be in a sense vulnerable with her in a really damaged way. And I, I thought that ended up being a really powerful element. Yeah, I agree. And and when he went to get the medicine, yeah, you know, he wasn't without redeeming value, uh, which made him in some ways more scary because he was real and monsters aren't real. Well, that's what I, I love that they wrote him that way. And I guess it is a little disappointing that uh, that William H. Macy's character was written so uh, just it was just it was so straight up. This is exactly what this character is here for. And that's it. Uh, yeah, but I think and I love William H. Macy, but I do too. as an actor, I think there were colors that he could have brought in around being more tormented with himself about the fact that he was so disgusted about this that would have allowed us to go, yeah, I understand it. I understand you more. I don't like who you are, but I, 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 I'm not so angry that I don't want to watch the picture. That's an interesting bit of perspective because I'm, you know, I get torn between uh, picturing this as a, as a, the way the character was played versus the way the character was written. And I, uh, you know, in this case, I immediately went down the the line of this this character was underwritten. Um, but, um, uh, but you say that there is, uh, there, there's a way that Macy could have played this and, and satisfied more of your needs. I think there's always a way that you can find the soul in a character and, and to portray the struggle that they're going through with themselves. There was a part of him that knew this was wrong and he didn't want to do it. But I don't feel like the audience was allowed to see enough of that to really take that in. And I think that would have made a big difference in that character. I do. We as actors, we, we have to find the truthfulness of every moment. For example, if he had played that exactly the same way and was on the verge of tears, you would have understood his conflict. If he'd worn that a little bit more on his sleeve. Obviously, this was a choice that he and the director made. It's not a choice that worked for me, mm-hmm. or it, it seems for either one of you. I know in, in Cujo, there's that moment where he keeps saying, I want my daddy, I want my daddy, and I take him and I go, all right, I'll, sh- I'll get you your father. Yeah. Right. And Dan Black came to me the next day and said, oh, D, I need you to come look at these dailies. I I think maybe we need to reshoot this. I think the audience is not going to like you. I went and looked at it and I said, Dan, I think you're crazy if you don't have the guts to use this. Because every parent in the world has felt that, has felt that frustration, has lost it with their kid, and been sorry they lost it with their kid and uh, felt guilty, but they were just pushed so far in a situation that they couldn't control. So if you had not seen the love between me and the boy, and if you hadn't experienced everything that we'd gone through, then that moment would make the audience not like me. But I really believe that the audience is going to look at and go, oh, my God, I've so been there. Well, that's Are the third telling, dimension. Absolutely. You're telling me that as fathers, you've never had moments where you've lost it with your kids and wish you hadn't? Oh, my goodness. That's why that is you are just describing why I felt at the end of this film I had to go touch my children in their sleep, because that movie made me realize uh, what I look like when I'm at my not very best. When I get frustrated at the at the experience that I'm having there, that's the perspective that I got from this movie, from watching her have to recalibrate every time she got right near that edge of breaking when she got frustrated. That's, that is the, the parental vibe that hit me. That's that third dimension that you're talking about. I can't, I, I just, that's what makes me feel. 
Well, and it's an interesting thing because it, I, and I, I don't know if this is uh, kind of the way that you're describing it, but but when he came up and told you that, it also it, it seemed like there's a certain element of him saying, "Hey, as as a as a as an actress, do you want to do you want to be seen looking this way?" You know, it it seems like he was almost thinking more about you and your concern about your your. No, I, uh, I, I, pers- I think like what was, the public perception would be over what the character would be. No, I don't think so. I no? think okay. I think he knew that if he lost any sympathy from the audience for the mother or the boy or the relationship, the movie would be in jeopardy. And he thought that moment might. And I thought that moment would solidify for the audience. This is a real relationship with a mother who loves her son and loves her son so much that she loses it because she can't save him. Well, uh, yeah, and we see we definitely see that in Brie here. I mean, she has so many of those points throughout this film. And we get to kind of witness so much of that as she struggles with all of that, uh, you know, all the way through her attempted suicide and everything. I mean, she really... Uh, I was really kind of blown away by her performance. I don't think I've yes. seen her in a whole lot, yeah. but man, I mean, it was it was pretty stunning to watch her just a raw performance here. And I love it that my business, you know, will embrace a newcomer like that and and judge just for the performance. It when when speaking of I, you know, for me, the direction and the the just general placement of camera, the the more interesting perspective is the first, again, 50 minutes. And, um, you know, I want to talk just briefly about your take on um, how they portrayed the constrained space of the room. Um, you know, the work of between Lenny Abramson and, and Danny Cohen, um, just showing us this sort of interesting take on I don't know, I'll use the word materialism. You've already talked about the Andy, you brought up the sort of um, the way they capture the the objects and, and the way they have build relationships with these objects. How they shoot these objects, I think, was particularly special. Well, they made them they, they made them alive. They made them they made everything in that room something that was alive to him. That's why he would say, Good morning, you know, good morning, stool, hi, stool, hi, window, hi. You know, very much like we'd get up and we go hi to our teacher and hi, you know, it was it was his his they were his touchstones. And I think it was brilliant the way it was shot. And it's so difficult to uh, for a DP to find different, interesting, varied angles to keep one set alive for that long. It's really an amazing talent. We had to do it. I mean, um, what Jan de Bont did with a car in Cujo was amazing. You know, the car literally became a thing. Right. And I think even the way that the actors handled uh, the props and handled the things and hung up, you know, they would show us, um, her washing the clothes and hanging it up on a line, you know, um, in a very microcosm way, they were leading the same life as we live every day. Absolutely. Well, and that, that's, I loved how they actually shot it because you, like when he's in the bathtub, everything is so close. The camera is so close that it almost feels like a different space than when they're over, uh, working in the kitchen area or when they're at the bed or in the wardrobe area. And even though it's all in this in the same space, they shot it in such a way where it actually really feels kind of separated. And because I really for them, it was right. Exactly, for them, it was that little tiny room had all those different places of life for them, and and the camera always represents either the voyeur watching or the the character's perspective and interaction around where they are at and with the other actors. And that's what the camera was doing the whole time was creating their relationships with this very small, but very large world. 
Is it interesting that the, the uh, potentially the contrast here that that Danny Cohen as DP uh, is uh, also uh, the man behind the Danish Girl uh, that you've already mentioned? Uh, another just gorgeous, very very different, very different, very yeah. different film. Beautiful film. Yeah, uh, amazing performances there. I, again, I it would that was just a haunting film for me. But you know what's funny about it is that when you look at the at the transformation of space that we get in room, the transformation of person in the Danish girl ends up being a very sort of similar motif that I think he captures super, oh. really beautifully. I think that ends That's up being... That's interesting observation. That's very true. Telling a story in film form from a child's perspective can be very difficult. I, I don't know very many films that really do a very good job of of sticking with it as far as keeping it from that perspective. I think E.T. is a great example, actually. Um, but you don't get it too often. And I think maybe, I don't know if directors, it, it's just hard to tell a story from that perspective. I know they always say, oh, kids and animals. Um, but, I mean, I think Honey, does... I wouldn't have a career. I know. It's, <laughs> that is your career. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but I think, I think Lenny does a great job here. Now, I hadn't seen his other films. Had you seen, uh, what was the one he just did? It was Frank, right? Frank, which was awesome. I didn't and, see Frank. Oh, I missed that you one too. People, it was one of my very favorites. It's so, so unbelievably wacky. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, but you talk about just redemption. Uh, it, like it, it is such a beautiful redemptive story. So different than Room. It is just the other end of the spectrum, uh, and and I think demonstrates this guy's uh, fantastic. Um, just ability to adapt to the story. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. I'm going to go get it. Put it on your list. You will want <laughs> to wear a giant head everywhere you go after you see this film. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> it's that It's that good. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't seen anything else that he did. What Richard did, I know, is another one that's, uh, uh, that was uh, supposedly worth seeing. Uh, the rest, uh, Garage, Adam and Paul, couple of episodes of prosperity i haven't seen any of it just frank and room but this this film really cements it this makes me want to a really watch out for his name um as as new projects come up but b I'm, i want to fill in the blanks because i i really enjoyed this I, I i'd have to see frank but just from watching this i mean i really love how he handles the story how he handles his actors i i, I think that he really allowed them to kind of just explore these performances. I, I enjoy them quite a bit. They, uh, there seemed to be a lot of freedom, you know. Uh, I would hope so. I, I would hope that, that Bree and, and, um, and Jacob were given a lot of freedom within the confines of what they had to do, you know. It appeared that way, it, and it appeared they had a beautiful connection with each other. Oh, yeah. They they really felt like a natural pair. They absolutely did. You know, bottom line, if the relationship between them doesn't work, you don't have a movie, period. As somebody who's been a mom in a lot of movies, I, yes, I am sure you have the experience of that. You have to really create that connection with the uh, child performer. Is that, is that a strange thing? I, I've always wondered as I wrap my head around these kinds of relationships when I look at, at Brie and Jacob, the act of developing intimacy with a child actor. Um, I mean, you use the word sort of, they just want to play with you. And, and I hear that, but I have trouble taking it as lightly as you portray it. You know, it's so easy working with a good child actor. It's just easy. It's a lot easier than working with really good adults <laughs> because really good adults are going, well, maybe we should do it this way. Well, what do you think about that? Well, you know, they get into these head trips and kids are just in the moment. They're just in the moment having fun. I mean, come on kids, you know, they come in and go, let's, let's play Peter Pan. Okay. You're Peter Pan and you're Captain Hook and you're Tinkerbell. And no, I want to be, all right, you be Tinkerbell. And you know, they don't go, well, God, I don't have any wings. I don't know. <laughs> What's my motivation, really, to fly over there? You know, kids don't get into all that stuff. They just go, yeah, okay, let's play. I'll even be the alligator. Rawr, rawr, rawr. You know? So, uh, for me, most... working with kids is, is joyful. Uh, Danny Pintaro and Henry... 
um, effortless. It was effortless working with those those kids. Effortless. They were, I, you know, I we're in a in a perspective just watching movies. I mean, they stand out as terrific child actors. Jacob, I think, is there. Um, uh, now I'm going to forget his name. Uh, he sees dead people. You may know him from seeing dead people. Oh, Haley yeah. Joel Osment. Uh, right. Yeah. Haley Joel Osment. It was terrific. Um, but they they are in sort of a class by themselves. We've seen a lot of child actors that are that have been, uh, you know, uh, it's it's troublesome to find their way into the story from from the outside in. And so I'm, I'm always curious what it means to be um, to be cast opposite someone who doesn't have the ability to overthink, I guess. And uh, oh, well, I you know, I love it. Uh, uh, for me, it's it's easy. It's just easy. I have a, a series on right now on Amazon Prime called Just Add Magic with three lovely young um, uh, preteen, early teen girls. And it's just a joy working with all of them, mm. with, with all of them. They're professional, they're beautiful, they're in the moment, they're spontaneous. You know, it's, I just like working with kids. And I like working with dogs. <laughs> I'm a big dog lover. <laughs> Although I have to tell you, Lassie, the 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 dog that we had in the new Lassie was just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I don't know, Alice. They 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 found this direct descendant right from the real Lassie. Oh no! And so they created the whole thing around this dog. Well, he was a direct descendant of Lassie. But unfortunately, he had just been a house pet ever since he was born. And so they were trying to train this dog to do all these kind of things. And this dog was not going to have anything to do with it. Uh, so we used, we used Lassie's stand-in and stunt dog a lot. Oh, how funny. <laughs> the dogs on Cujo, my God, they were just trained within an inch of their life, really. Beautiful. That's so good. So funny. Oh, so my funny. goodness. Well, I have a question because talking about kids, it, it made me think about something. And uh, I'm sure this is something you've had to deal with in some of the films that you've been in where you've got a really dark story, but then you also have such a young person involved in it. I, like, I mean, I, I know you weren't on the set of Room, but obviously – there's a there's a darkness to the story. I mean, would they go into the detail talking talking to Jacob about this, or just kind of give him kind of just kind of a a, a semi clean version on the of the director? It? Like, and it depends on the kid. Yeah. No. Um, he was old enough, probably at that point, to know the difference between reality and fantasy. Um, Drew well, he was, was eight. <laughs> Drew would walk up to E.T. and start talking to him in the corner. So Stephen had somebody working E.T. all the time to keep E.T. alive for Drew. It, it just depends. I mean, Danny, you know, I uh, because I'm awfully careful when I work with kids. And I say, okay, this scene, you know, the monster's coming in. But you, we know it's not a real monster. We're just acting, right? And, and afterwards, I would say... Okay, well, you know, the dog, he looked really mean that time, but we know he's just going after a toy, right? Because literally kids cannot distinguish between reality and fantasy until they're about five years old. They go in and out. And um, so, Danny, we got to that scene, you know, where he had to um, have his seizure, right? Right, right. And I said said, so are you okay doing this? Are you scared? Or, he looks at me, he says, D, when I was little, he was like five, right? <laughs> when I was little, I had one of these, you want to see? And he went, <laughs> right? And, and then he looked at me and he said, pretty good, huh? And I went, okay, I so don't have to worry about this kid. He was oh, an so old, funny. old, old, old soul, uh, <laughs> that kid. And he, we would get through with those hysterical scenes and both of us would be crying and we'd have to get ourselves back together. And he'd come up to me and go, we were pretty good, weren't we? That was pretty dramatic, yeah. D. You know, so. Oh, that's but, so good. 
But it, it depends on the it depends on the child and it depends on the director and it depends on the mother. So Andy, are you keeping up with how this was how this is performing? Yes, I am. You have some numbers I, for I us? I've been I've been keeping up on it. Yeah, so this film cost about 6 million dollars to make. So it's a decent little budget for a film. It oh, ended up That's what we call low budget. Come on. That that is low budget. Yes. <laughs> It ended up making twice that back domestically, about just over twelve million, and internationally a little over six million. So all told, it made made a little over eighteen million, which boiled down to about a hundred and nine thousand per finished minute. Not bad uh, for a, a small movie like this when it's compared when it's when it's up against movies like The Revenant and The Big Short. And this is it's just a terrific. It'll make more piece. after the after yeah. the Academy Awards. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a, a, a very solid film, and I think that uh, it deserves. I mean, it's up for four Oscar nominations: Best Picture, uh, Best Adapted Screenplay uh, by Emma. I believe she wrote the screenplay herself. Yes. Um, best uh, uh, what else? Best Director and uh, Best Actress. Deserved all over, uh, with the exception of the missing uh, award for Jacob for Best Actor. Yes. Yeah, I think he should have yeah, gotten something. Sure. Um, D, have you heard of uh, a flick chart? I have. I looked at it a little bit today, but you know, it was kind of technical. Well, this we're going to make it as non-technical as we can. You know me and technology. You, you are going to not only not only are you going to love it. I'm sure uh, you're going to open your very own account and you'll spend all your time on it, and you'll have to be pulled away. Uh, because I'll, I'll it, let you know when that happens. <laughs> Please, I'll be standing by. Keep us informed. <laughs> uh, so the whole purpose here of Flick Chart D is that we get a chance to rate this movie against the list of other movies that we have already talked about on this show. And it is a one-to-one ranking. It is room versus other films, regardless of genre, regardless of tone, regardless of theme, any year, anything else. It's just which movie would you want to put on right now if these were the only two movies that you had and so we have a list of a large list of movies that we have talked about over the last four and a half years and we're it the flick chart just runs us through about uh, eight or ten of them and then we'll see where room lands on our list if we run into a movie that you have not seen don't uh, never fear andy and i will rank it and uh, uh but i am sure that you will have no problems with this again future flick chart addict d wallace Andy, Andy, let us begin. All right. So first up, we have Room or The Bad Seed. Oh, Um, hands down. Definitely. Room, yes. That was an easy one. All right. Room or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Room. I'm going to say Room. I know this is I a would favorite probably for you. Go, it is one of my faves. I'd probably go Eternal Sunshine, but Room takes it two to one. All right, Room or National Lampoon's Vacation? Room. Oh, Room. <laughs> yeah, definitely Room. Uh, room or Brazil? Room. That is my favorite movie, so I'm going to go with Brazil. Pete? <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to have to stand on Room, Andy. Oh, all right. It and it's good. not it's not only because I'm sucking up to D right now. <laughs> <laughs> I paid in. Uh, that's right. I know. Room or touch of evil? Room. Oh, uh, uh, I did like that touch of evil. Something awful. Yeah, I'm going to go Talk touch about of evil monsters. I know. I think I'm going to have to go touch of evil on this one. Oh, boo! <laughs> Room or alien? Oh. Oh. That's a tough oh. one. I, I have to go alien. It's yeah. such different pictures, guys. This, I know. This, this, is is, <laughs> this is what we call a flick chart hate crime. You God. have no choice. You have only two movies on the shelf. Like Wizard of Oz and Psycho. Yes. Right, exactly. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> I, I think I got to go with Alien on that one. All right. Uh, room or All the President's Men? Oh, All the President's, all the president's Men. All the President's Men. Uh, room or Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid? Butch Cassidy. Butch Cassidy. I think we've Cassidy. hit that. We've hit the high water mark on. Uh, I think. Room. Yeah, I think that was it. Uh, all right, that's it. Number fourteen on our flick chart. It's smack dab between Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, 
and Brazil. Wow. Woo-hoo! Number 14 out of how many movies now? Uh, that would be out of 227 or so. I picked a good one, didn't you I? You crushed it. <laughs> Thank you, Wallace, for the good. win. <laughs> <laughs> we we actually live in fear that uh, at some point we're going to have a guest who brings a movie that we hate. Uh, we have yet to run into that, but uh, but that's is, is you. Thank you for keeping the streak alive. Oh uh, come on, your viewers will love that. Out of five stars, where would you rate this? Four. No, it's you know there's another site that we do it's called letterboxd.com and that's where we keep our film diary of all the films we have a community of people over there who follow our follow all of our our write-ups for films and so we ha- we do an aggregate star rating just out of 5 stars for me this is a 5 star movie uh, hands down at 14 on our list I can't I can't go less than 5 stars you know if William H Macy wasn't in it it would be five <laughs> I because <laughs> because I am a wussy <laughs> It's a five star for me, despite William H. Macy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think the first half of it is five star and the last half of it is four star. That's still pretty, so, that's still pretty high. That is pretty right. high. Yeah, so four and a half. <laughs> four and a half. There you go. <laughs> Well, uh, like it. D, thank you so much for being here. We uh, this is uh, as we wrap up. This is our big shot to hear what you are uh, what you are up to. Can you can you share with us what you what you're doing these days and what oh, you're excited about? What am I not doing? Well, I've already mentioned a lot of. I've got a, a series on Amazon Prime. Binge watch everybody called Just Add Magic. Uh, I just finished that film called Red Christmas in Australia. I just had a fabulous Supernatural guest star on. Just booked a movie um, called, I'm not quite sure how to say it because I just booked it today. Ayla, A-Y-L-A. Really weird, bizarre, fabulous little film. And I'm waiting to hear if the series gets picked up, and I'm waiting to hear for a big movie that's trending already. Um, Offer should be coming in any day. And, you know, I do all my healing work. I've got a radio show on every Sunday morning. I want everybody to go to bupabear.com, B-U-P-P-A, bear.com, and check out my new toy that I have, that Andy's beautiful daughter, Olivia, has one of. She and, loves it. And, you know, I'm I'm just out teaching people how to create their lives and be happier. So I'm doing a lot of stuff. What fantastic stuff you do. This has been so great, Dee. Uh, you, uh, you know... You, you, I know you come on this the, our little show. You don't really know us. You, you work mostly through Jody. We've been talking about you for years. Uh oh. Yes, and so this is a you, you, you've really, you've really, you've checked something off of both of our bucket lists tonight. So thank well, you. Well, so I've much. had a ball. You guys are a hoot. <laughs> I've never done anything like this before. It was a lot of fun, but I'm oh. glad people can't see me without my makeup. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> In most of my movies, I couldn't have looked much worse. So, <laughs> you know. Oh, too funny. Well, definitely thank you again for joining us in the next Reels Speak Easy D. And for uh, you out there, we hope you enjoyed our show. If you like what you heard, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, Letterboxd, and Flickchart. And don't forget to head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and comment. It really does help more people find us. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time... Good night, Sink. It's hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. 
Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock, and Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today.